in the name of Almighty God, the most gracious, the most merciful. Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, I would like to go straight into it as there's so much to deal with. But I'd like to thank the PNM for allowing the Minister of Health to come and give us that comedic relief that I think after three days we very much needed in the chamber. Yes. I will completely discount this presentation, which was personal, yes. and in a time of so much suffering among the people of Trinidad and Tobago, I think we have more pressing issues that I will henceforth address. You know, it's indicative of this government to talk about people doubling down on propaganda and therefore it turns into what we perceive as, as mendacity. This government was in power for 30 un uninterrupted years, unprecedented wealth, and achieved virtually nothing for the people of Trinidad and Tobago except skeletal healthcare systems, educational systems, and eventually closed down our most prized asset, Petrotrin. And nothing, not only doing that, I refer to the comment, and I know the Honorable Senator meant it in the most nostalgic of ways. When the senator said, Trinidad is nice, Trinidad is a paradise. She was referring to what is an ideal. Because when has Trinidad been a paradise for the people of Beetham? When? When has Trinidad been a paradise for the people of Laventil, where my mother came from, and who I have witnessed a steep decline over the years, over the decades, directly represented by that party, by that party since 1956. When has this been, Trinidad, been a paradise? Under this government, when our indo trinbegonian brothers and sisters were politically, economically, and socially discriminated against? When? When has Trinidad and Tobago been a paradise for our Shouter Baptist brothers and sisters who this government discriminated against and the UNC had to rectify that situation? Of course. When has Trinidad been a paradise for the people of Mongdo, where I grew up, for the people of what we call Zone, Charvel, Trinbegonians, what we call them? Gonians, the Tobagonians, who were treated as second-class citizens. I know that myself. And I hear people referred to here as they come from Tobago, and I come from Tobago too. Because this is Shea and Tobago, I consider myself a Tobagonian as much as anybody. And I will speak on the seas of Tobago. Of course. So to hear this government come now and double down on the propaganda, that they espouse every time that they're in government, forgetting or hoping that we, the population, forget that they have been basically in power for 47 years. 47 years they control the treasury. What did they do? I will not use unparliamentary language. Misappropriate. But I would say that this quandamanian wastage is recorded and documented. But before I go into my substantive presentation, I want to just clean up a few things that need to be addressed. When I heard the Honorable Renuka Sagam Singh Sukla, I would not address it. Because comparing her presentation to the Honorable Senator Lachmidia, chalk and cheese. Chalk and cheese. Chalk and cheese. But when she went into the issue, when she went into the issue of child marriages, 
I'm speaking about child marriages. Well, I was, I poked up. I was so happy. I thought then eventually she will transition into the child abuse. The child abuse that has been rampant, documented by the SABGA report, which implicated directly PNM operatives who were criminally functional, in case they want to know the difference between the two words. Leading to what? Direct evidence of their operatives being involved in the brutal murder, rape and murder of Akil Chambers. The murder of Semyon Daniel, Antonio Francois, which spawned what we now call the Justice Judith Jones Report. I was a witness to that report. I was, and that report came about when I was mandated by our honorable political leader, Kamala Prasad Bissessa, and our deputy political leader, Jolene John. Based on what I found out, that Justice Judah Jones report came about. Do you know that they stand up, they sit down here talking about child marriages? When that report has been laid on the Prime Minister's desk and nothing has been done to address the issues indicated in that report, abuse continues, continues at the homes, homes that are basically that have not attended to, to, to children remain being paid, getting money. Who getting that money? The Children's Authority. Now we have this youth. Now we have this youth, if you see, something that is visionless about foster care and people will be paid if they take care of children. We'll expect lines like we saw in C3. Because people will be looking for money. We went for the council. And we don't know what will happen. So I, I advise this government before they look at the speck in someone else's eyes, so look at the big boulder in their own. Because that issue of child abuse was not only perpetrated by some PNM operatives, but until now it continues. Senator Renuka Sagan Sinsukal disputed whether this was the worst office of the mismanaged office of the Attorney General. What can I say? If the head of that Attorney General office is an internationally acclaimed perpetrator of mendacity, thrown out of our Mr. court. Mr. Vice President, standing order. There's a fact. Mr. Vice President, I'm moving up a point of order. I want to hear. And it was brought up. Was on the other side, is a standing order being raised. Please allow the process to happen, please. And members of the government bench, just one at a time. Mr. Vice President, standing order 46 6. <laughs> Senator Nakid? Yes. 46 6 points towards. Imputation of improper motives. I ask that you move on in your presentation, please. Let's go on. Mr. Vice President, what I have stated is a fact. Our Attorney General at present was thrown out of a Miami court for what could be considered mendacious activity. That's a fact. I'm not making that up. That is documented. 46 6 and 46. That you are on chart. No, no, no. 46-6 recognized. Senator, kindly continue with your contribution. Thank you. I'm guided. Mr. Vice President. There was a judgment they like to give, but they cannot take. Mr. Vice President, once again, 46-6. No senator shall make an imputation of improper motives against any other member or an offensive reference to a member's private affairs. It's plain English, Mr. President. Both sides. Senator Mark. Yes, sir. 
I have recognized the standing order, and I ask that you move on. What you have not done is moved on. You have made your statement. I have not asked for retraction. I have not asked for an apology. I have asked you to move on. Please move on without dragging the point further. Mr. Vice President, with all due respect, I have stated a fact, documented. It is not, it is not because it makes them uncomfortable that I will Senator stop to Nakid. make that fact. Senator Nakid, I believe the point is actually on the hand side today at least three times. You have made your point. I ask that you move on within your contribution. That's it. Guided, Mr. Vice President, that the point has been made. Also, in addition to what happened in that Miami court, we have an issue of that of Office of Attorney General with the Vincent Nelson matter, where it has been proven that bribes were paid to a witness to implicate UNC officials in illicit activity. That is a fact as well. So I think when Senator Sargam Singh Suklal seeks or sought to defend the Office of Attorney General, she did herself no favors, nor did she do the Office of the Attorney General no favors. Mr. Vice, Mr. Vice President, I didn't want to dwell too long on the issues that came up from the representations on that side. Because as we know, we are so beset with the issue of crime in Trinidad and Tobago. And this government obviously has no solution for it other than deflection, deception, deception and plain outright misinformation. And that, that misinformation is not, is not new to the People's National Movement. It's not new at all. And I reference the MP, the MP for Tinapuna, who in his contribution, which I was so happy, I was so happy that finally that the MP for Tinapuna made a contribution after eight years <laughs> and spoke about Tinapuna. I'll tell you why. Last year, it was excerpts of his speech last year in the last budget was plastered all over PNM platforms, only to find out that he never contributed in last year's budget debate. <laughs> Something that is very common to this government, where they try to make people who are hapless, hopeless in their portfolio, they try to give them some kind of credibility. So he finally made a contribution, which he read poorly, over 49 odd minutes. But I had to listen. And it sounded very much like the Senator Sukai's first contribution in the Senate, which was cringeworthy. But MP for Tinapuna went on to state that Tinapuna, a community that gave us some of the most brilliant politicians, some of the most brilliant sportsmen, the most brilliant thinkers, he told that community after eight years that what they can look forward to from him was a thousand dollar grant and $3,000 back pay. That was the extent of his contribution. And what was sad is that in his whole time, he never mentioned in the eight years that he presided over Tinapuna, one development policy that he instituted in Tinapuna. He didn't, he didn't present one sporting policy. He didn't present one community building policy. As a matter of fact, in their manifesto, before the elections of 2020, they spoke extensively about renovation of the Tinapuna market. All we have now, after three years, 
is a market that parents running around from week to week, dodging bullets from bandit into Napuna. What we have is every two days, a matter of fact, just up to yesterday, and I think Senator Sunita Maharaj mentioned it, when she spoke, somebody had been killed on St. John Street in Tinapuna, murdered. And just yesterday, the same thing happened in Mengur, somebody again killed. So instead of Tinapuna being a place, an arena of ideas, a field of discussion, it has turned into a killing field. In a Puna Center killing field. You know why? The PNM continues to put people out there to represent the people based on how they look, what they appeal to, the most common denominator. People lacking substance. And, it's, and I ask myself, you know, because let me rephrase that. There, you will find among the weeds, a couple of roses. I say that clearly, like my colleague from Tobago, who I, I genuinely admire. But other than that, the landscape is sparse. The cupboard is bare. Listen to their contributions. Listen to their contributions, personal attacks. Listen to the Minister of Health who came in just to launch attack after attack, personal. You could hear it. What did he tell us about the health sector? What really did he tell us about the health sector that we can go away here feeling comfortable, feeling, giving us some sense of hope? Is he going to deny to us we don't have our own sense of, of sight? Is he going to deny to us that we don't see what is going on in the hospitals? The arches that were conceived under the NAR. Conceived under them, and of course Patrick Manning brought it to fruition. But they were conceived under the NAR. The idea was that every community, which is a first world idea, every community will be self subsistent in healthcare. What a noble idea. What a noble idea. That's how it should be. What have they done? You go to those health centers, they're skeletal, skeletal, machine missing. Uh, in, invariably, as you go in, after half hour, they'll send you to Mongto or to San Gandhi, where it's overburdened, already overburdened. So what do you have the healthcare systems for? And where's the budget for healthcare? Doc? Eight billion. Eight billion spent. Eight billion dollars. No machines for dialysis, no scans, and then they come here to talk all kind of, I don't want to be, to, to talk rubbish, basically, about what they have done. What have you done in 47 years? You have squandered money. Can you deny that? You have proven anything about honorable in how you have addressed the people. And again, your appeal continues to be to the most basis of our instincts. Mm -hmm. But the people are fed up. And I bring it back to the community, Mr. Vice President. And I repeat it again and again. And maybe it will sink into them. Why is it that the crime rate in the constituencies that the PNM control is higher than everywhere else. What are they going to, to tell us that, that that's not the case? But every statistic shows that it's the case. Why is that? And funny enough, the party that put, portrays itself as the party of the black man, but black people suffering the most in this country. Black people suffering the most in this country. And the, our indo chimbegonian Indo brothers and sisters should be the first one to thank Dr. Williams for sidelining them. It forced them to work by the sweat of their brow to realize their dreams and not depend on this government. Because the people who depended on this government, look where they are. 
in every social and economic index, they're on the bottom of the ladder. Do they care about that? Do they care about that? They can't deny it. They cannot deny it. It's fact. But they can sit down here and smoke and laugh and pong the desk with venom because they're making our money. They're doing well. They come in to tell you, take three, 350 extra. And they're telling you that with pride. And be grateful. Because for them, that might be every five minutes I work. And by the way, none of them distinguishable. Eh? Take them out of politics. They made, they're, they're unemployable. <laughs> I say that confidently. I know I made my name before I came into politics. Yeah. <laughs> David Nackett was David Nackett by his mother's and father's insistence on education. How many of them? As a matter of fact, coming into politics has ruined some of their reputations. <laughs> So to, for me to hear, Mr. Vice President, the party that every time we hear them speak, they don't speak about the thing that matters. They'll speak about the UNC. They'll speak about, and hear what, not only that, they'll come as Senator, or another one who, I must say, I, I like him. I don't talk with him. I ain't talk with none of them. I ain't care about none of them. <laughs> But I must say, I like that. But he come yesterday totally unprepared and talk about revisionist history. Who is more revisionist than this group here? This present <coughs> rowley led group. Who more revisionist? Uh, sorry, the Prime Minister. Continue. Who is more revisionist than them? As a matter of fact, yesterday in 20 minutes, they revised the whole history of the OAS. <laughs> in 20 minutes. Dr. Carson Charles came with a document stating in December 2015, correct? December 2015. In 15 minutes, they hustle up a paper, very big, give it to somebody who could barely read and talk about April 2015. Come on. That's the politics they're involved People suffering. People getting shot in the bed. People can't go to the police station and make a report. By the time they reach home, they're getting killed. Black people until now, let me tell you a story. My grandfather, David Benjamin Harris, I was named after him, came up in a, let's say a middle class home, but he married Imelda Charles. That's rural Charles from Despois, that is his aunt. That is my grandma. Married her, took her out of love until. And one of the first, this is documented, one of the first what we call Kukobion black people to start a business. That is the turn of the century. Started that business. Was getting real pressure, so he made an association. He was a bit of an activist. She took an association of black businessmen, put their money together, and they began their businesses. But of course, with expansion, reach a point in time, they could go no further. They needed help from the banks. Republic Bank again, they know they like the French Creole merchants blocked them, bankrupted all of them. So after he took my grandmother out of love until, gave her, lived down near the sacred hearts, down in town. So a big improvement at the time. He was bankrupted, died heartbroken, fighting against the system. Has anything changed for black people in that regard? Can a man from Lavantil go and get fi financial access? Like other people in China, they, would they address that? The they destroyed small and medium enterprises in the last eight years. Nikon could go. But Nikon could get millions of dollars. And when the prime minister is asked to address that, he given us talk about Magadog and Magadog. You are responsible. All that money that you give to favored communities, to elevate favored communities, but the major stakeholders, the African and the Indian stakeholders of Trinidad and Tobago, still fighting to survive. 
in 2023. And then you all come here and talk like you all have some kind of authority or moral authority on the UNC. You all must be mad. The UNC is the party of the poor. You know I know that? Because I'm on the street. You all don't go on the street. The party of the poor. The UNC is the party of the poor. And I say that without fear of contradiction. And if they are the party of the poor, again I say, why are all the people in their constituencies mostly in and above the, the poverty line? I just had a, something sent to me that almost 30% of black youth in Trinidad in and around the poverty line just sent to me. In Tinapuna, for sure, youth unemployment almost close to 50%. And then you don't want to ask, why is it easier for a black youth to find a gun than it is to find a job under this government? Instead of crying shame on yourselves, you're all content to sit there and come in parliament and laugh and, and feel like it's some joke. We trade insults, you trade insults. I'm not interested in having none all here. I thought you all would come at least with something to educate and uplift the population and put some meat on that bony thing that you all call a budget. But none of you all did that. You all just content to insult. Is it any wonder, Mr. Vice President, do you know that in some constituencies controlled by the PNM, that some of the residents refer to the community as the Gaza? Do you understand the gravity of that statement? That some residents of their communities, PNM communities, refer to themselves as the Gaza, they live in the Gaza. What does that tell you? That tells you they feel besieged. They feel locked in. They feel excluded. What is more telling than that? They have been excluded from the process. I heard the MP for Tobago West, who is now the Minister of Sport. I listened to her. Painful, painful, spoke for 40, about 48 minutes. Generalities, eight years as Minister of Sport. She couldn't point her program. She loaded this one. All of the people she loaded, they had no part in that development. She couldn't come with one modality, not one sporting modality, to tell me how you'll take me and they're responsible for that, by the way. I will take a seven-year-old child through 14, which is the first modality. I'll help all you out a bit, so listen up. How do you take them from seven years old to 14 years old? And then from 14 years old, how do you take them into the second develop developmental modality? Nothing. She come and talk about some events they put on, about some money they give in the elite. But when people reach the elite, you know what Kishore Walcott said? He said it's not about the money. He said when he's training, he wants to be sure that if something happens to him and he gets injured, he has a certain infrastructure he can depend on. He said he doesn't have that. That's what he said. But they're content to come and tell you they give money to this one for the elite assistance program, and they give that, but they're not concerned. Their job is development. I became an elite footballer, not because of that. I was developed because of, of the civility, the good-heartedness of people in China and Tobago who spend their time mentoring me. We don't have that. People don't have time. That is the job of the government. But you go in Mandela Park, and you, you had to wade through 
the bottles and the rubbish, which they sell them clean, the other way through the used condoms. Uh, sorry for the language, but that is the fact. All of that on the ground, because they have nothing suitable for purpose. They have no ideas how to take sport from here, from Trinidad in 1956 to 2023. They have a savanna, basically unused. I bring anybody here from Europe who has an idea about sport, and they say, what's going on here? Have a million uses. But I won't go into that with them, because they won't, know to, they won't know what to do with it. But I'll give you all an idea, because I don't want to be like you all, and just come and talk tripe. I want to help you all, because people are dying, and sport is an avenue, and community development is an avenue to take people from here where they have the idea of turning into criminals, criminality or going into a productive life. You have, a, you have a, a savanna there that you cannot continue to use like in 1956. You can break it up into individual sectors that are self-sustainable for every community around the savanna. It's right there. It's right there. If you use your brain a little bit, that's the intellectual def deficit we talk about. Laziness. And then you can make every community in charge of every one of those sectors, you can make them generate income, that is generating employment. But you all have no ideas. And that is, that is me in five minutes. You all had eight years and you all can't do a thing. And then again, we spoke, we're speaking about community development. Tell me one community that has developed under your, under the PNM. One. You all can't say not one community have you all developed. But then again, it's right there. We have 41 constituencies in Trinidad and Tobago. Let's say in eight years, well, you all might have ten. Let's say we develop every year four communities. No, no, no. Let's not get greedy here. Two. Because you don't have a lot of bright people on that side. Let's say you develop two communities every year. In the eight years you had, you would have developed 16 communities. Two sport, two social support. But you all have no integration of what? Portfolios, because you all do not understand the thing. You all don't know what it means to govern. You all understand destructive politics. But this one do this. This one do that. This one do that. I do that. In 2010, they do that. What resonance that has with the people at Trinidad Tobago? You all had somebody come in here. He's a doctor? Minister of Health is a doctor? No, no? Well, then again, you all had somebody come in here and speak about how they save lives and things. Instead of talking, you talk about your life, they say we are very happy for that. Talk about the over 400 and something murders until now. The 600 last year and 500 before that. But you all content just to score political points. But I think the people of Trinidad Tobago are well and truly fed up. Certainly, certainly, certainly my Gonian brothers and sisters are. And no matter how you all try to paint them, they will not forget that you are 21 years uninterrupted. They will not forget. And what did you do? You did nothing. You collapsed the sea bridge, the air bridge, tourism, and you all come in here to talk about it. You all collapsed that. And I feel sorry for him. I really feel sorry for the Minister of Tourism because how, for somebody like him, he's a lawyer, I think he's a lawyer, to come and, and be, be in praise of our Trinbegonians rushing to get employment on a cruise ship and claiming that as policy. Come on. Mr. Mr. Vice President. They're proud, people want to leave. You know what I mean? That is really scraping the bottle of the barrel, looking for, for some kind of resonance in the policies. Come on. Senator, you have five more minutes. And here's that. I like how he asked me, why didn't I stay in China and play football? What a question. Because you all have no pathway to professionalism. 
you all have not been able to create that. So I had to go outside, yeah, like so many hundreds. I had to go out, as a matter of fact, do you know right now, Mr. Vice President, I train, as Senator Jolene John will know, I train disadvantaged youth. Of course, some who can afford it, but I like to bring them together. Every one of them to a man. Some from Sealots. I get help from people who are country. Some from Sealots. Every single one of them. They can't wait to leave Trinidad and Tobago. Coach, organize a scholarship. Coach, you know why? You all do not have any pathway. You all have not, in 47 years of governance, given anyone a pathway to excellence. What you all do? You all come and cover that. People reach excellence on their, by their own. No by their own. No you, give no, you give no one any help for that, uh, of meaning. And listen to this. After 46 minutes, or a little less, of absolute nothing from the Minister of Sport and Community Development, she went on her usual, or the PNM usual, MO, Modus Operandi. MP for Tobago West, thank you. It's the first good thing I say all session. <laughs> what, she, what did she do? What did the Minister of Tourism do? Nothing. Come. Sport. Sport, Sport. Sport. sorry. What did, what, did, what did she do? <laughs> come and talk about. You might have your come and talk about UNC lining up. <laughs> Listen to this. USC lining up African and Indian in rows. Yani, that is the go to of the PNM. Always has to appeal to race. <laughs> lining up. Well, I want to ask a question. All the people in C3, those pictures we saw, African, Indian, we line them up too? The thousands of people that run to C3, and for the president, was the president's officer job? Yeah. We line them up too? The cruise ship. I mean, how reprehensible they all can get? Everything you all have to try and appeal to our lesser angels. But I think we've had enough. In closing, Mr. Vice President, I'd like to point out to you that what this budget basically represented was a, what we call, you know, the old people. I say my grandmother and they talk about going in town and do some window shopping. How many minutes are How many have you? Doing window shopping. You know that? Some of them only know what that means. Window shopping is means you can't afford. So you go, pass by Glendinins, have it right, remember Glendinins, Kopalani's, and just watch in the window. They can't go inside and buy nothing. That is this budget. All the goodies inside, and who can go in the store is only who the PM lets in. Their friends and financiers. But no goodies inside for the poor and working class people of China to be. So all we can hope for, all we can hope for is that people continue to wake up like they did in the local government, realize that this government has done nothing for the people of China to be in eight years and will continue to so to do. And we look forward, Mr. Vice President, to bringing true governance to the people of China to I thank you.